Here we are. Hello everyone and welcome to this family workshop brought to you by the Great Exhibition Road Festival. Um, today we'll shrink ourselves down to the size of atoms and molecules to explore exactly what makes certain nanomaterials so incredible. We have some drawing and making challenges for you too, so very exciting. Um, my name is Scott and don't worry it won't just be me today, I'll be joined by other people. Uh, so in a moment we'll be joined by Jess Wade who is a physicist working in the Faculty of Engineering at Imperial College London and also we'll be joined by the illustrator Melissa Castrion. Uh, now, you can't see her face, but we have a number, another member of the team, Rosie, and she'll be with you on the live chat and she will pass on your questions and anything else you want to say to us. So if you want to join us in the live chat, an adult needs to sign in and use a Gmail address. Um, we'd love to hear who you are, all of you, um, in the live chat. If you want to, please tell us your names and who the children and adults are so we know who's there. Um, if you have any questions at all about drawing, atoms or materials or anything else for that matter, please write it in the same place and we hope we'll be able to answer them by the end of the workshop um, and indeed throughout the workshop. Uh, please make sure that you've got what you need for the activities today. So you will need some paper, you'll need some colouring pencils or colouring pens and you'll also need a pair of scissors. Um, there is also an instruction sheet for you to download and you can find the link to it in the description under the video and there are some colouring sheets for fun as well. Um, we'd love to uh, see and what you make today. So we'd, we'd love to see what you make today rather. So please take photos and share them with us as we go along using the Padlet link in the chat and in the description under the video. And remember to ask permission before using an adult's phone to do this must ask for permission. But without further ado, that's enough from me. I will introduce you to our other guests here on the workshop and that is Jess and Melissa. So hello, Jess and Melissa. Hello. Hello everyone. Hi. Brilliant. Hi. Lovely big hellos there. Fantastic. So uh, we'll start with Melissa. Melissa, you are an illustrator. That's, that's correct, yes? Yes, that's what I do. I illustrate books um, for a living, uh, which is the best thing in the world. Um, yeah, and I'm going to be, um, no, <laughs> Jess is disagreeing. She, she thinks her job is, her job is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'll be drawing today and I hope that you're going to be drawing along with me. Awesome. Fantastic. I've got to say, put my hat in the ring. I'm also quite a good drawer too, but <laughs> probably not as good <laughs> as the pair of you. <laughs> and, um, Jess, please, uh, can you tell us what got you interested in all things small? Hi everyone, I'm so glad to be here. I'm really interested in all different kinds of materials and what I'm really interested in is how we can build new materials using really, really small things, using incredibly small things that we can't even see with our eyes. And what I find most interesting about it is how we can change how materials function or how an object behaves by interacting with those really, really small components. I guess most of my big curiosity with small things comes from not really being able to see them with our eyes. So we've mm. got to go much smaller than that. But me and Melissa thought it would be fun if we could start off by thinking about what the smallest things are around us. So in, in the room that I'm in, I have things of really different length scales. I have massive things like a bottle. I have smaller things like a, a toothpick or something like that. And then I even have even smaller things than that in, in kinds of grains of salt and different kinds of materials. So we thought it would be fun to start off by just looking around the room that you're working in or that you're, you're watching this in and think about what the smallest object is that you can find. I think that's fantastic. So yes, um, please everyone have a look around your room. What's the smallest object that you can find? Pop it in uh, the comments and stuff and we'll read them out. Also, we got um, a hello there from Elliot, Violet and Rob. Hello back. Thank you so much for watching us here today. Um, so yes, tell us or any small things that you might have in your room. We can see some small things there that Melissa's drawing. What are you drawing there, Melissa? Um, so I've got a little pin that I'm drawing. I can't find many tiny things. I draw the head of my pencil. I'm actually drawing mm. the pen, but I've got lots of pencils about me. And I draw a tiny little bug on the ends, just kind of um, for fun. Um, I'm going to draw a button, because that's also teeny tiny. Mm. Um, 
if anyone has any suggestions as well, I'm I'd love to hear your suggestions of stuff that I can draw. Um, that would be fantastic. Or even from Jess. There we go. <laughs> Things Him that you some... can draw. Oh, great, great suggestion coming in that you could draw something like a grain of salt. Grain mm. of salt. That is a really good suggestion. I've got mustard seeds as well. Dice as well great suggestions keep them coming in everyone and a, and a tiny rubber duck indeed thank you kelly for that. <laughs> that is a good one a tiny rubber duck is a really good one <laughs> now uh jess these things that we've all talked about are indeed very small but the stuff that you're interested in very much interested in is even smaller than that it's even smaller than that and actually the word small is really confusing because it depends on where you're looking at it from right Mm -hmm. So we're very small. Humans are very small compared to our houses or our schools. Our schools are really small compared to our cities. Our cities are really small compared to planet Earth. So something like Anne's suggestion of a grain of salt is really small compared to me, but it's really massive when we think about things like a virus or a bacteria. So the word small is really confusing to think about. And actually what I'm interested in and the, the structures I'm interested in are even smaller than that. They're even smaller than things like viruses. A virus is massive to things like atoms. So when we go that small, when we get to that kind of tiny, tiny, tiny length scale, we have to use a different kind of, of terminology. We have to think about things in nanometers, not things like centimeters or meters that you're familiar with. Mm. And a nanometer is incredibly small indeed. Can you imagine how small a nanometer is, Mel? Very, very small. <laughs> I can't imagine it, Jess. Sorry. Very small. <laughs> so if, any, if anyone has a ruler nearby, maybe Mel does in her studio, but lots of you will have rulers in your pencil case. And if you look at the smallest thing on that, it's probably a millimeter. To get to uh, Scott's having a little dig around to see to get there to something like a nanometer, we have to go a million times smaller than a millimeter. So you can imagine how tiny a nanometer is. If you hold up the piece of paper that you're using to draw on, that's about a hundred thousand nanometers thick. It is so incredibly small when we think about atoms and molecules. It's kind of hard for our mind to understand. Wow, that is that is indeed. I'm I'm here trying to think about that myself, and like we've got some lovely more comments here um, for people. So Mishran said an ant, fantastic. Again, very small ants. And uh, Robert, um, we've got like small marshmallows as well, because you can get the big ones, can't you, yeah. Robert? But you also get the tiny ones. And let's have a look here, at, and a grape as well. Thank you, Philippa. Um, let's have a look at the other bits that you're drawing there, Melissa. So I can see the ruler there as well. What other things? What are you drawing now? Oh, yep. Yeah. So there's a grape. It looks more like a cherry. Um, mm -hmm. Drew a sugar cube. Um, Fantastic. Tried to draw a grain of salt. I don't really know what it looks like, but it's just tiny there. Um, mm. uh, draw some bugs. They're always tiny. Draw lots of ladybirds out in the garden at the moment. So they're you know, teeny weeny. Oh, that's fantastic. One of the one of the most fantastic professors I know, a professor called Sandrine Hertz, told me that when you go as small as a nanometer, that's the distance that your nails grow in one second. So if you look at your nails, if you think about how slow they are to grow, that's yeah. how every single second they're growing one nanometer. That's how tiny a nanometer is. Wow. That is that is very that is small indeed. Very small. Yeah. So that there's all... the, sorry, there's my finger. There we go. Really? The nail. Yeah, that's great. Now we're getting a little bit of speed information. We're learning how often Mel cuts her fingernails. <laughs> mm. Or bites my fingernails, Jess. And Don't I tell you what, as well, we've got a comment here um, uh, from Verity. Um, they've mentioned an electron as well now. Mm. Um, and oh, we've got a pic as well on the Padlet. So hopefully we can have a look at that. Any pictures that people have, please send them in. Uh, myself, Jess and Melissa would love to have a look at them. Amazing. So what we've got here. Hey, fantastic. Artwork coming in live. That's awesome. Fantastic. That's great. And the Verity is right. An electron is incredibly small. It's so small that we find them really hard to measure and detect. 
because mm. electrons are even smaller than atoms. Electrons are inside atoms. So to go to that length scale, we have to look super deep inside and it's really tricky to do. Wow, indeed. And are there things inside those electrons as well, Jess? Oh, that's such a big scientific question and mystery. I think that that's one for the scientists who are currently drawing. That's who, what they'll be working out, whether we can look inside electrons. At the moment, we find it really hard to, to look at where they are. We know a little bit where they are, but we can't be really specific where they are in an atom. So trying to find out what's inside them would be even more tricky. But for everyone in the audience who doesn't know what electron means, Verity is, is clearly a genius, but an electron is the part of an atom that can move electricity around. You have the inside part of the atom where most of the mass is, and then around that you have these whizzing little charges called electrons. And so, so we kind of understand where they are and how they're arranged, but we don't understand it enough yet to look inside an electron. Because when, when things are this small, when things are as small as structures like atoms or molecules, we can't see them with our eyes at all because they're so small that our eyes can't resolve that feature. If they're a little bit bigger, we can see them with something called a microscope, but atoms and molecules are even smaller than that. And we have to wow. do really fancy experiments to work out where they are and what they're doing. Indeed. Well, that, that'll be for another workshop, another time looking at those things. But um, before we move on, just want to do a little shout out to Ashcroft Technology Academy Steam Club. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. So thank you so much. And also, uh, Melissa, I see at the bottom there you've drawn some salt. Is that correct? Yes. So I've drawn a salt shaker and then I've attempted to draw a little, um, Jess, what would you call it? A... Crystal. The crystal structure of salt. Yeah, crystal structure, which... Mm, teamwork makes the dreams work. <laughs> <laughs> Good segue, right? I love it. it an incredible segue. I like it. Ar artists and scientists working together now. <laughs> Jess, would you mind telling us a little bit more about salts? And, yeah, salt, and salt is actually one of, one of the most amazing crystals that we have because it's so common because you probably have it on your kitchen table. You've definitely had some salt today. You've definitely probably sweated out some salt today. Salt is a crystal that has a really beautiful structure that Mel's drawn on, on the art cam. But it's a crystal made up of sodium and, and also chlorine arranged in a really beautiful arrangement. And actually, we can see the kind of structures and shapes in salt when we look a little bit closer to it. Mm -hmm. And that's a confusing thing to say. But I introduced before the idea of going from seeing with our eyes to seeing with a microscope. But if we want to see even closer, so if we want to see how those atoms are arranged in each grain of salt, we have to use really, really bright, powerful light called X-rays. And when we do that, we do a science that's called crystallography, which is unsurprisingly the study of crystals. And, <laughs> and that lets us look at exactly where those individual atoms are arranged. So I'm going to ask our great backstage team to bring up the kind of microscope camera now. But you can see in here, in this little pot, I've got lots of grains of salt. And then if we put it under my nice little cheap USB microscope that I bought, we can start to see more kind of structures emerging in those grains of salt. So we can see wow. all different shapes and facets that form on the surface. Maybe you've seen these in kind of, I don't know where you'd have seen these. You'd have seen in these this, this close up. But you can start to see all of these different structures that emerge. And actually these kind of microscopes let us go really in depth into different kinds of materials. So here's a kind of beautiful little stone that I found that's beautiful and shiny. And now if I put it under our microscope cam, we Just can get this see scope really, cam up again. We there can it is. See really beautiful things. <sighs> so, so, so by studying things at a really small scale, we can understand them better and then we can use that understanding to design new materials. And that's what I find most exciting. Oh, that is incredibly exciting. Oh, I love that. And it just um, uh, it just makes it all look so beautiful. I mean, as you mentioned, Jess, um, salt is something that um, all of us are used to. We see it in our kitchen cupboards every day or it's on the table, ready for dinner. And you pop it on your chips. But when you look at it really closely, it's like a beautiful, uh, like a structured thing. It's just fasc really fascinating stuff. And we can see now Melissa's drawn her um, uh, some uh, salt crystal there. And we were trying to go even smaller than salt. So we were trying to work out, me and Mel earlier on, how many atoms would go inside a salt crystal that you might use on your dinner. 
And the right. number is so absurdly large. So to, <laughs> to try and guess how many atoms there might be, you have mm. to work out how heavy it is and how dense it is and X, Y, Z, do some calculations, which will come as you grow up. But the number <laughs> is about one with 18 zeros after it. So that's, that's how many zeros. individual right. atoms, those that's little right. those little atoms that Mel's drawn in the picture, these little blue and dark blue dots, I think, if my eyes are not deceiving yeah. me. Those individual atoms, there's one with 18 zeros after atoms in a single grain of salt that you might use on your dinner. Wow, that is a lot. You'll be thinking about next time you have fish and chips, everyone. Um, and just to say as well, please um, send in pictures on the pad and any comments, any questions that you have, send it to us and, uh, and Jess and Melissa will be happy to answer them for you. Um, but we got um, as well a comment from Verity about a, a down quark. Again, that's fantastic. Awesome stuff, Verity. But yes, again, it's mentioning lots of small things there. Verity, um, uh, is, Verity is doing an undergraduate physics degree. There's no way. Yeah. <laughs> so inside, if, if we look inside the dense part of an atom, so in mm. the middle of an atom, there's something called the nucleus that you may have heard about. And around that is where the electrons are. And if we can look inside that nucleus, we see there's a little bit more of a component. There's something right. called protons and something called neutrons. If we go inside those, we have all different kinds of quarks. So, so Verity is either needs to be honoured and celebrated for her genius, <laughs> or she's definitely more grown up than I think I was at that age. Definitely. So, yes, and a, a big shout out to everyone. Thanks so much for sending sending in your pictures. I believe we've got some on the Padlet now, so we'll have a look look at some pictures that have been sent in. <gasps> oh, look at that! Look at that. So detailed. That's, That's amazing. Lovely. That's awesome. So beautiful. Oh, these <sighs> are great things that are coming in. Look at that, oh, and I love that everyone's put their finger for scale as well. That's fantastic. They look great. A good They're question has come in, Scott, from Daniel. Mm, there is indeed. Daniel has asked, what is made of one atom? Thank you for that question, Daniel. We usually think of atoms as joining up to form bigger things called molecules that you've probably heard of. So it's it's rare that we think about atoms on their own. We can think about hydrogen atoms. That's the lightest type of atom that we have. There are lots of different types of atoms and, and we, me and Melissa love to explore all of the different types of atoms. There are over a hundred different types of atoms and we call them we call them elements. That's something people might have heard of. We have a table to sort these, these elements out in. And so the smallest, the kind of what's made up of one atom is just something like hydrogen. But then something that we're really familiar with that we breathe every day is something like oxygen. And oxygen is formed from two atoms joining together to form O2, which is a molecule that you might have heard of. So everything is made from, from individual atoms. But certainly when we, when we think about individual atoms on their own, they're so hard to look at and study. We don't really think about it very often. Wow. And um, to talk more about uh, nano stuff, we're gonna, I'm just going to mention some comments here we got before we move on to our next section. We've got from Rafi, the smallest possible size is a Planck length. Um, thank you, Rafi. And um, how about a pion as well? These are probably things for you, Jess. <laughs> These are things that are really at the extent of, of, of we're going way smaller than nano now. So wow. now we're thinking about things that are infinitesimally smaller than we can imagine on a nano scale and I think probably uh, very important for the design of future materials and technologies to make the world better but they don't help us right now in understanding them and actually Mel's showing just how beautiful these structures can be so just how beautiful if we look really really close up at individual molecules and atoms in a material these kind of patterns emerge and I just think that's really extraordinary. That is extraordinary as well. And fantastic drawing there. Yeah. And I just, yeah, as you say, the patterns then, symmetry is brilliant. Um, I've got a question for you, Jess. Um, and that is, uh, what is nanotechnology? So we talked about nano small things, but what about nanotechnology? Oh, that's such a good question. So when we look at pretty much everything in the world around us, so our chair, our bed, our bicycle, we've seen a material that we've taken from, from the planet Earth and we've turned it into something that we want. So we've seen mm. a tree and we've cut down the tree and we've turned it into a chair. We've gone from something very big 
to something very small. It's a kind of top-down approach. But when we think about nanotechnology, because of our understanding, because of the experiments we've done, because of the beautiful drawings that people like Melissa can do, we're thinking about building materials from the atoms upwards. So we're thinking about exactly which patterns we want to put into a material, exactly which properties we want that material to have so that it does exactly what we want. So if I want to make something that's really good at carrying electricity, or I want to make something that will do something awesome when I put it in a magnetic field, I can do that with nanotechnology because I can choose where my atoms go, how they join up, and then what property they'll have. Wow, you have all, all that control. <laughs> Fantastic. No, that you sounds have all really that control to nudge the atom to do what it wants. So these drawings Mel's done are just absolutely amazing. You can see the kind of patterns that we see in nature and the way that we might see patterns that are really regular and reproduce a lot. This is a fantastic one. So which ones have you drawn, Mel? Can you tell us? Yeah, so I've drawn the salt crystal, um, crystal structure, um, and sugar, which is this one. I haven't quite completed it because it would have encroached a little bit on the salt, but that's that's most of it. And then we've got oxygen, which you talked about before. Oh, fantastic. And we've got water, um, and we have graphene, which so we will be talking about. Yeah, this is a really this is really cool because you all see and, and everyone at home can see how regular these patterns are and how that the regularity of those patterns gives rise to really cool properties. And and I love it, Mel. They're absolutely beautiful. Thanks, Jess. They are indeed. It's so awesome to see. And um, uh, um, just before we go um, to uh, Melissa, where hopefully we'll be making something pretty awesome in just a second, just going to ask quick questions for you there, Jess. And that is a um, question from Rocco is, is there something smaller than a quark? These these audience questions are really, really challenging. I'm going <laughs> to go with right now. We don't think there is. But again, like the question about going smaller than an electron, we're still trying to work out exactly what these things are and where they are and how we can study them. And, and there are big international experiments filled with scientists from all over the world, thousands of scientists that are trying to investigate quarks and other fundamental particles to understand them. So definitely it's an ongoing question and we need scientists like Rocco to come and join us to do it. Definitely. But, Something I love about Mel's drawing is this, this pattern that you see a lot, this hexagon shape. It's in graphene, you can see it a little bit in salt. You see it in footballs, you see it on things like honeybee honeycombs that, that bees live in and that bumblebees try and live in. And a hexagon is a really useful shape when we're thinking about atoms connecting to form molecules because hexagons are really, really strong. They're very hard to, to squish. They have a high strength, a high tensile strength for all of those physics undergrads in the audience. But mm. also that when we lay them flat on a, on a sheet, if we connected lots of hexagons together, you don't have any spaces in between them, which is why honeycombs are incredibly efficient when you look at a bumblebee hive. So hexagons are a shape that we see a lot and, and they, they, they repeat a lot in really cool materials that we use every day. That is fantastic. And yes, so talking about that and talking about graphene, we've got a few questions about graphene and we'll get on to those in just a moment because right now, uh, Melissa, you're going to show us how to make something that can help understand these crystal structures. Yes. And this is something that everyone at home can do. So so what will everyone need, Melissa? Yep. So what you'll need, you'll need some glue. Um, hold it up here. Um, some glue, some scissors. Um, some colored paper, it doesn't necessarily have to be red and black, but if you've got red and black, that would be great. Um, red is for your carbon atoms, and then the black is gonna be for your bonds. Um, is that right, Jess? <laughs> Completely right. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we are gonna be, be making this today. Um, which is a fragment of graphene. Uh, we're gonna be making the paper version. Um, so I have this, oh, if you can, is it got art cam there? Art cam has come up. There we go. Um, so yeah, if you 
you don't have to print this out, but it, it is quite useful. Um, otherwise, you can uh, just pay attention and I will try and um, it's clearly show you how to make this guy. Um, okay, so That's if you get great. your if you get your red paper, um, you're going to need to cut out 14 circles for this. Um, you, I am going to use my print stick lid, but you can also use pretty much anything round. You can use a one p piece. Um, so I'm just going to make 14 of these and then cut them out. Um, and as I do this, Jess, if you want to talk about. Yes, no, definitely. Uh, we've got a question for Jess um, from CC Lynn. Thank you so much. We've got loads of questions. Remember to everyone send in your questions. We'd love to hear them and send in your pictures to Padlet as well. But what CC Lynn wants to know is what things use graphene? Oh, that's such a good question. So maybe first, Scott, we should say what graphene is. Graphene is a kind of wonder material that that we've discovered occurs in nature, but we've discovered how to isolate it and make use of it. And graphene is made from these carbon atoms. It's made from the element carbon connected together in these hexagon shapes. And what happens when you've got carbon atoms connected in that way is that they can form a really long, massive sheet. Actually, we can have graphene sheets of any size. And the, it kind of links to another question that's come in from Mishra saying, does that mean that graphene only has 14 atoms? No, actually, what it means is that we've drawn a tiny fragment of graphene to understand exactly what's going on. And graphene, you can see from the fragments that you're creating, those carbon atoms are all bonded to other carbon atoms in this hexagon shape. And actually, you all have graphene around you in your houses, and what you're using for the workshop includes graphene. So, so a pencil, the lead of a pencil, is made from a material you might have heard about called graphite. Mm -hmm. Graphite is also made entirely from carbon atoms. But what graphite has is a bunch of these graphene fragments stacked together, like a stack of playing cards. And when you write out with your pencil, you kind of smear out those carbon atoms across your page. So if you look really, 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 really closely at the marks that you make with a pencil, that's coming from those carbon atoms. Now, graphene is when we take off an individual sheet of those carbon atoms. So graphene is a material that's about one atom thick. It's incredibly interesting material. It is really strong. It's transparent, so we can see through graphene. It is really good at transporting electricity. So if we want to make a material that is really conductive, we can use something like graphene. But it's really, really light. And it gives lots of strength to whatever we're including it in. So we only really discovered how to separate graphene from pencils about five or six or seven years ago. So it's a recent discovery that we've been able to manipulate it. It won the Nobel Prize in 2010. But it's a recent discovery that we've been able to play around with it as much as we do. And now we found that we have so many different things we can do with it. And that was the actual question, right, Scott? I've completely I think so, that. yes. What things you can do with graphene, yeah. You can do so many things. Let your heart go wild and your imagination run wild with what you could create. One of my favorite examples and Mel's favorite examples is using the kind of mesh-like structure of graphene to work as a sieve. So you can, you can imagine and you're cutting out and creating this beautiful graphene molecule this fragment of graphene. In that graphene fragment, you see a lot of holes in between where these carbon atoms are joined up. So you have your six carbon atoms in your hexagon. Around them, you have all the bonds connecting those carbon atoms together. And then in the middle of that hexagon is a hole. And what scientists have found is that we can use those little holes to filter out particles we don't want. So you can go to parts of the world that don't have access to clean drinking water and you can take a clean sheet of graphene and you can filter out all the dirty parts of the water by passing it through that graphene sheet because they get stuck in those nano size holes. So we can use a tiny, tiny material to do some really big things. That is fantastic. No, and I know that scientists, uh, and I know a few scientists, they love useful materials and graphene does sound like that. Um, luckily, we've now got some awesome photos to show you from our Padlet. So we're just going to have a look at them. Let's have a look here. Oh, brilliant. Oh, that's great. 
Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. If you guys don't have the materials, then draw just drawing it out. That's um, amazing. These are like, so great. Look at that. That is fantastic using those hexagon shape. Brilliant. So Thank good. you. The cool thing that you get to when you've got these beautiful drawings is that when you connect lots of carbon atoms together in this way and you form a sheet of graphene, you can also roll it up. So when you roll up a sheet of graphene, we saw, we form something called a carbon nanotube. And a carbon nanotube is really useful. Mel's actually done it. So she's <sighs> managed to create a carbon nanotube out of a bigger fragment of graphene that she was working on earlier. And you so can see once it. you guys make the, um, the sheet, I've actually made a worksheet in order to actually make this. It takes a while, um, but if you download it and you have a spare moment, then you can make one of these, which is really fun. It's really, really fun and satisfying to make. And um, they are so awesome, carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes can have incredible properties and characteristics when we put them inside material. They're only about one nanometer across. So Mel's version is a gigantic, massive version of a carbon <laughs> nanotube but we can use the inside of that nanotube to do even more incredible things. So we can put medicine in there and guide it around our bodies. We can make really light and strong tennis rackets with carbon nanotubes, and we can make more efficient airplanes with carbon nanotubes. So if we just take our sheet that we're working on now and roll it up, we can do extraordinary things. Awesome. And now I believe we're on, uh, Melissa, we're on to the next section. We're on to the next bit. Yeah. So if you guys get your black paper, whatever paper that you want to choose, these are going to be your uh, chemical bonds, which will bond your red um, carbon atoms together. Um, you can use a ruler to make them straight. Um, I've just improvised and just, just doing it um, freehand. Um, so what you need, you need thin strips like this, and you need to cut 16 of them, and they've got to be roughly four centimeters long, but um, if you lay them onto the sheet, then you'll be able to tell how long they need to be. But yeah, so 16 of these all together. So I'm just gonna cut these out quickly. Awesome stuff, and while you're cutting those out, just gonna say a um, quick comment from Kate and Elliot, the fact that graphene filter stuff is how filtering straws work, which is amazing, so thank you so much for that. And also, um, uh, just a quick question for both um, Melissa and Jess to answer as we um, uh, make the final finishing touches to this make. And uh, that question is, because um, um, we've got another drawing challenge, but that's a little bit later on in just a few moments, but first I have a question which is why do you think artists like Melissa and scientists like Jess like to work together sometimes? So that's my question to everyone. Why do you think that artists like Melissa and scientists like Jess like to work together sometimes? So if you've got an answer to that please feel free to um, tell us in the chat we'd love to know. Um, but Jess and Melissa do you know any other scientists or engineers or doctors who work with artists? Um, well, I do know of um, someone who lived a very long time ago um, who was an artist and an engineer, and it probably could have been a doctor as well. Um, probably heard of him, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that guy. <laughs> that guy. So, yeah, so before, um, before uh, art and science was kind of split up, I suppose, it it was, he lived in, an, I guess, an era where everything was um, a lot more connected. Um, and yeah, I don't know, Jess, if you want to elaborate on that. I, I, yeah, I think Leonardo da Vinci is a great example. I went, before I studied science at university, I lived in Italy for a while and I was particularly interested in all of these different artists, people like Leonardo da Vinci, but also architects, people like Brunelleschi who build these absolutely incredible domes of cathedrals because they worked in, in science, in engineering, in architecture, but also in beautiful design and creation. So I definitely think, you know, people like that and, and, and lots of scientists and artists that I know working today really combine the two. But I think we've had a really great example of it in the last year, you know, trying to explain the pandemic, trying to explain social distancing, trying to explain a virus, trying to explain how we need to wash our hands regularly or wear things like face masks. 
all of those have required really, really great visualizations. So we've made discoveries based on science. We've investigated them further. We've understood more. But we've had to, as scientists, convey a message with the world. We've had to say, this is how we'll keep safe. This is how we'll protect each other. And I think that comes from really great artists and designers working together. So I, I do know a lot of them. And I'm hoping to know even more because I think it's so amazing. Indeed, we've got lots here, lots of suggestions from the audience. Also, just want to mention as well, Afcross Technology Club, um, the STEAM Club. Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, Jess, but it does, uh, STEAM is acting for science, technology, engineering, arts and math. So it's really good to see Ashcroft yeah. uh, Technology there um, getting involved, incorporating the art in there. Um, but other things that people have mentioned um, where scientists and artists can work together. Um, scientists use diagrams. Yes, indeed. So they, they'll we need have diagrams to... all the time. I mean, Mel's making a diagram now. This is how we understand <laughs> graphene. We don't. We, it's a drawing. It's a representation of how the atoms are arranged, and that's how we understand it. So I definitely think that's an important thing. Awesome. And as well, I love you're using Karate Girl Rachel. That was from. So thank you so much, Rachel. <laughs> Sorry, Melissa, I interrupted you there. What were you going to say? I was, um, I guess, with the helix, the DNA helix um, models, the 3D model of that, I guess, Jess, I don't know the exact history of it, but did that help them kind of understand how um, how DNA works is actually by trying to make a model out of it? Exactly. We, we, so when, when, when scientists like Rosalind Franklin were studying the, the helix of DNA or when we were trying to understand the atoms and the molecules that made up biology and human and plant life. They they went to do some experiments with some really bright form of light. Remember we mentioned before crystallography using these really mm. bright x-rays to investigate materials further. And when you use those, you, you have your really bright x-rays, they come in, they hit all the atoms and the molecules and they, they form some kind of pattern and image. And it was only when scientists like Rosalind Franklin went out and built that structure and tried to imagine what pattern would form when the light hit it, that we were able to understand anything about things like DNA. So definitely building models, making diagrams is so, so important. Mm -hmm. Same yep. for architects and engineers. You can't understand the, the structure of how a building will stay up until you actually make models, right? Yes, completely. You have to Indeed. build those perfect little models. My favorite thing in art galleries is when they have an architecture room. You know, the, the summer exhibition at the Royal Academy has a really, really great collection of architecture and buildings and small models of buildings. And I love exploring that. That's great. And just as um, Melissa makes the final finishing touches to um, um, the graphing there, I'm just going to mention a few comments that we've got here. We've got Mishra, artists are able to make a, a scientist's thoughts come to life on paper using illustrations. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Mishra, for that. Um, yeah. Sam and Nate have said, because science is beautiful. I love oh. that. I love the caps as well. Amazing. Um, Sandrine, artists help visualise the work of scientists. Indeed. Yep. And um, as um, Melissa and Jess were saying, um, they're working together to help visualise it, help laymen like people like me who don't really know a lot about science to help understand it. Um, we've got Shun Shun, um, because art and science can assist each other in pioneering. I love that word, pioneering. Amazing. Um, and Shun Shun from Ashcroft Technology Academy said, says that one good example would be Anna Dimitriou, who is a bio artist specializing in microbiology and art simultaneously. Awesome. Thank you so that much. That is there, so cool. Dream job there. Cool. Making a note of that. And um, we, have we, I think we got the final uh, piece of art there as well, Melissa. Yes, here we are. So, if you, so it looks, once you've made it, it looks a bit shabby on this side. Um, but if you just turn it over, let it dry. Um, there is your graphene fragment all finished. And once you've made that, then you can make a giant sheet um, and then you can roll it up and make a, um, oh yeah, if you just put it on regular cam, my face cam, thank you. Um, then you can make one of these. I love it. I want it in my bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> when the workshop is finished. I'll be a nice lampshade. 
Yeah, <laughs> bit of a useless lampshade. But. And a, a potential fire hazard, so we are not going to encourage that. <laughs> that is a very good point. And um, we've got some lots of questions and comments coming in, coming in, and we'll get round to answering those and reading those out in just a moment. But just before we do, um, now we're going to think about how our knowledge of materials and their structures can help us protect the planet. So, uh, Melissa, you have a new drawing to show us. Yes, I do. So, I just need to adjust my camera. You're so slightly. good at drawing. It's unfair. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only thing I can do in life, Jess. So. I do not believe that for an instant, but you are absolutely <laughs> magical. <laughs> so, this, oh, does that work? Let me go up a little bit higher. There we go. Down. Does that work? It's Let's perfect. Go. So yeah, this is uh, my drawing of the world, um, just a section of it. Um, yeah, and so we are going to be looking at, um, if you want to draw along with me, um, we are going to, uh, Jess is going to be talking about how uh, things such as global warming, deforestation, microplastics and pollution and how nanotechnology can actually, um, hopefully, save our planet. <laughs> no pressure, right? No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um and we also would love for you to draw your inventions um of uh thing like just inventions of, of how we can fix these how we can fix these things. Um that's yeah. Jess, you're a lot better than talking than I am. No, so. I, I was I was loving the free flow. So we thought <laughs> we thought that here, instead of just thinking about atoms and molecules and crystals and things that are really small and really useful, we'd think about how we can use those atoms and molecules to make new materials, ultimately to save our planet. And I think we had a question for our fantastic audience, which was, can you think of any reasons that this wonderful planet that we live on need our help? And, and I think that we can share those in the chat if anyone has any of those questions. But there are a bunch of different reasons that me and Mel thought that the planet really, really needed our help. If we start off, maybe let's see if any come in. If, there, if, any, question, if any suggestions come in, then, then Scott will let us know about it. But one of, the, one of the ones that you might have heard about or learnt about at school is that we rely on materials called fossil fuels to power our lifestyle. So we rely on burning materials like coal, oil, and gas to try and get us around cities, to try and build new buildings, to try and fly us between different countries. And, and some of you may have thought a little bit about what fossil fuels are. So how do we get to making something like coal, oil, or gas? And, and they actually form from the remains of plants and animals that died a really long time ago. But the unfortunate thing about fossil fuels is they're not very good for our planet. And at the same time, we're running out of them. So we're using up all of those old fossils and they're damaging the planet that we love. So what we need to think about is new ways to fuel our society and the ways that we live. I don't know if anyone at home wants to, oh, we've had a great comment in the chat from Karate Girl Rachel saying that occasionally, ice uh, not occasionally, ice caps can melt. And that's happening because of our over-reliance on, on fossil fuels. So actually something that, that I think is, is really kind of interesting to try and do is to think about ways we can find new materials or find ways that we can create new kinds of energy sources or find new ways of converting energy into different forms. We've always relied on these completely unrenewable forms of energy. But what can we do for a renewable energy? So we've had a question of Adam from Ashcroft Academy. This is a big one, Mel. I'm going to pose it to you. Okay. Um, can you clarify what evidence you have to prove the shape of Earth? <laughs> Ooh, that, that's a bit of a minefield, isn't it? Um, so... I think you've drawn it perfectly here. From space um, has definitely um, shown the curvature of our Earth uh jess i think that's a perfect answer even when you're just standing somewhere and you're lucky enough to be near the sea and you can see the curved horizon from that 
But if we went far into outer space, as great pioneering astronauts and scientists have done, we've seen that the Earth is a sphere. So we're pretty happy with that. But actually, we want you to start thinking about ways we can overcome these challenges that impact our world and, and our lives. The big one that we wanted to start with was fossil fuels. But there's also things like deforestation. And that's another word that you might have heard of. Can you can you think a little bit about what deforestation or something might mean? So hopefully everyone's everyone's thinking about that. But deforestation is basically when we cut down lots and lots of trees and people cut down trees for lots of different reasons, but mainly to farm on or to build homes on. And this is really bad for the environment. It's really bad for the way that our planet stores and sucks up carbon dioxide because trees are really important. So people all around the world need to come together to protect these incre incredible trees we have. And we're hoping that material science and innovation can help people to do that. So to get rid of some of this dangerous carbon dioxide. Scott, you're back. I am back. Apologies. My Wi-Fi oh. was, being, was being very naughty there, but I've come back to some fantastic drawings. Thank you so much. And also, if anyone in um, uh, on the Padlet wants to send their uh, drawings in, that would be amazing in the questions and comments. But we actually have a question from Sandrin. Um, can we use nanotechnology to make garments last longer and make them more sustainable? Thank you for that question, Sandrin. Awesome. This is such a good question from Sandrine. So can we use nanotechnology to make our clothes last longer and to make them more sustainable? And the answer is overwhelmingly yes. We can also use them to give them cool functions. So we can use nanotechnology to make wearable technology. So your t-shirt could become something that detected whether you have a disease or changed the way that you were interacting with particular parts of the environment. But nanotechnology can be used because it can be woven into the threads of our materials or we can carefully consider what those threads are made of so that they can wash themselves, so that they don't break apart as often, so that when we put them in the washing machine, we don't release all different kinds of damaging things to the environment. So we can think really, really carefully about exactly what atoms and molecules we put inside our clothes to make sure that they lead to a better tomorrow. And Sandrine might have heard about, about microplastics. So she might be thinking about the way that some of our more plasticky clothing like fleeces or kind of old, old kinds of jumpers that you might have. As we wash them repeatedly, they start to release these tiny, tiny pieces of plastic out into the environment. And these are really dangerous for, for the natural world and for wildlife. So what scientists are working on with new materials is to avoid those microplastics getting out. And what, we can do that pretty well now, actually. So we need to stop using them and also to make new materials that stop them getting out. And that comes from innovations in, in garment design. Indeed. And if anyone at home wants to create a material that will protect the Earth's oceans from microplastics, what would they look like? What would they be designed to be like? Awesome stuff. We've got some other questions here. One from Mishra. What would happen if there was too much oxygen on Earth? What would happen if there was too much oxygen on Earth? I mean, the Earth is is pretty good at looking after itself. You know, in general, until humans came along, the Earth can deal with changes in temperature. It can deal with changes in gases. It can deal with these kind of modifications that we make. But as, as humans have come in and as we've built factories and as we've burnt fossil fuels, we've made it harder and harder for the Earth to cope. So usually it has a really good feedback system and it can circulate currents and heat and, and pressure. But as we've come in, we've made it more challenging for that. I don't know exactly what would happen if we had too much oxygen, but I'm guessing that it wouldn't be a very good thing because too much of anything in the world is not generally <laughs> that good. But 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 we'll see. It's definitely something that I think Mishra could investigate as part of her scientific research. We probably get giant bugs, right? Because um, the reason why bugs used to be significantly larger before we existed um, because there was more oxygen in the uh, atmosphere. I mean, amazing fact. That is such a cool fact, Mel, that I did not know. 
<laughs> that is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. that, Mel. Um, I've uh, just been told that we have some amazing pics on the Padlet now. Ooh. So we have a little look at the Padlet, see what other people have been drawing. Oh, oh, wow. wow. That's incredible. That's amazing. Oh, I love the colour combination. I love the colour combination. I was just thinking that is great, isn't it? I love that on the t-shirt. That is fantastic. Wow. Again, oh, the t-shirts that we'd wear with those and designs on. That picture really was cute. perfect to show us how thin graphene is, right? You have yeah. this structure that looks quite big because we've drawn out the hexagons quite large, but it is so, so thin that it's only, you know, one atom thick. And that is so impossibly hard for us to imagine. But that picture shows it completely perfectly. So congratulations to, to the people who created that. That's amazing. These are That's amazing. fantastic. And we'll have a look at some more there. Brilliant. Oh, well done, guys. You I love it. Your, um, you can do finger painting. Um, just dip your finger in some paint and, and do that as your atoms. There's lots of ways to make it. They look so good. See, well done, atoms guys. and molecules are beautiful, Mel. You have to tell all your illustration friends. What kind of ways are you designing to protect our planet, Mel, over on your Earth cram, as I'm going to call it now? <laughs> so yeah, is that a question from one of the it's a question oh, from what, am I, what am I designing um so i'm taking major inspiration from uh i can't remember who mentioned the garments um so yeah i've drawn that i've drawn some default most of the drawings have been fairly negative so far mm -hmm. such as um lots of pollution from various uh vehicles um so it, anyone got any other suggestions then i would love to draw it and add it to this some more positive could you draw a solar panel for me yeah i could do that shall i draw a solar panel on a satellite that would be so cool because we actually had a question saying does nanotechnology help out in space and and we do use nanotechnology in space because we use nanotechnology to make the solar panels that then will power spacecraft so we can't get back to our house and plug in our, our, our spaceship when we're out. It's not like an electric car. It's something that we have to generate the power while the spaceship is moving around. And so all of the spacecraft that we have have these amazing solar panels on them. And when you think about designing a material for space, it's even harder than on planet Earth because we can't just make a material that will work at normal temperatures and pressures. It has to be able to get really, really cold and really, really hot and go close to things like the sun. So actually we have to make solar panels that are incredibly resistant. And to do that, we have to use nanotechnology. So thanks to that great question and Mel's idea to draw a solar panel on a spacecraft, that was perfect. Definitely. These are all fantastic suggestions, everyone. Please keep them coming in. Send your pictures in. Send us your questions and your comments. We'd love to hear from you. Um, also, I've got a question for you, Jess. Um, we've talked about all these challenges and come up with solutions and beautiful artwork. So have we finished, essentially? Do, do you think that art and science have all the answers or maybe not? I think it's so important to think creatively in science. Mel's shown it today how extraordinarily creative people can be and actually everyone at home's creations are so wonderful. Definitely. But thinking creatively when we understand atoms and molecules, letting us dream, go to bed at night and dream about a new material you could make the next day or a new way that you could apply that material to make the world a better place. Creativity is so important in, in both of our jobs as arts and scientists. But also we need to, to, to get stronger and to be happy that we can make mistakes that our graphene, at, uh, graphene fragments won't always be perfect, that every time Mel cuts out her bonds, they won't always be the same length because some of the best scientific discoveries and some of the best artworks come when we make those kinds of mistakes. So we need to, as scientists, think more creatively. I think artists already nail the thinking creatively and thinking scientifically and understanding that. But we need to, to get stronger so we feel brave enough to go into a science lab and to try building something we don't know will work or asking a question that we don't know the answer to. 
Indeed. These are all fantastic. We've got some lovely questions in now. And um, as we finish up our drawings here, we'll just see if we can get through these um, questions which are coming in. Again, if you have any questions, any of your drawings, um, as we're coming near to an end of our workshop now, send them in. We'd love to see them. Um, so uh, we've got one from Nikki. Is nanotechnology, uh, is it nanotechnology that makes materials react to the UVA sunrise? So is it nanotechnology that makes materials respond to ultraviolet light, which I think is what Nikki's asking is a really good question. It's definitely nanoscale interactions. So it's probably not technology that's been created, mm -hmm. but ultraviolet light, as Nikki knows, is is really high energy. It's really, really, sh we, we think about it in terms of how long the wave is, and it's a really short wavelength. It's really, really energetic. And that's why it causes damage to us when it hits things like our skin, because it starts to break the bonds in our skin and damage it. Sometimes irreversibly, but hopefully you've got enough after sun that you can prevent it. But it's actually those atoms and molecules, those atoms within molecules that respond to this high energy light. It's so high energy. It makes all the atoms it interacts with dance around. And when they dance around too much, when they get too excited, they fall apart. So it's nanoscale things, it's atoms and molecules, but it's not nanotechnology that, we can use nanotechnology to protect us from ultraviolet light. And we do that all the time when we make new sun creams or when we make win um, filters to go on the windows of our cars or houses. And it's definitely a nano issue to, to react to ultraviolet, super high energy light. Awesome. And I love the idea of, uh, of thinking of dancing to help explain it. That's brilliant. And just before we have a final look at um, um, uh, the piece of work, the piece of arts that Melissa has drawn and indeed everyone at home in the Padlet, um, this is a chance for you to tell us what your favourite part of this workshop was. Was there any bits you really liked, any facts that you found really fascinating, any drawings that you liked? Feel free to pop them into our chat um, and indeed um, uh, send us your drawings drawings as well into the pad that hopefully have another little look at those before we end but um uh melissa and jess do you have um time to answer a couple more questions i think so yeah of course yeah for awesome. sure so we got one from Daniel. I remember, Daniel, you posted this a bit earlier, so apologies that we haven't got round to you until now. But can we make small for infinite? And also, how small can I get? It's a lovely oh, question. Oh, man. Has Daniel been watching Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? A great <laughs> Are you Rick Moranis, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think we can go as small as is conceivable by us. You know, the, if, if you if you draw the number zero, if you write the number zero on your piece of paper and put a full stop after it, and then just keep putting zeros after that, you can imagine this is really tiny. I think my hardest thing is is understanding how small those, those kind of numbers are, understanding just how small, 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 small it is if we keep going on to infinity. So, so I think, Atoms and molecules are a pretty good place. I know everyone here loves quarks and pions and electrons, but atoms and molecules are a pretty good place to end up and think, this is small enough. When I've understood and manipulated this, I'll be able to make the world better. Brilliant. And remember to send those pictures in into Pad that we'd love to see them. Is it all right if we have um, a, a final look at um, uh, Melissa's piece of art there on our art yep. cam? So fantastic. So I had through the tech. I added the uh, what, Jess? What did you say? That's solar panels on a spaceship, right? Yeah. Well, it's kind of a sat. I, I may have cheated slightly. I googled satellite. And <laughs> I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> so that's that's an example that came up. Um, and that's and a satellite that's generating its own power. It's helping us talk yeah. with our friends and family overseas because that's how we send messages really long yeah. ways. And it also seems to be about to be hit by an aeroplane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very high flying aeroplane up there. But um, using nanotechnology to make aeroplanes lighter and to make the fuel more efficient is a great idea. Well done, Mel. Thank you. Fantastic. And also added a ship. I added the idea. I don't know if it exists yet, but having a, uh, a nano net almost, which could... Um, which could uh, take out all of the microplastics out of the sea. That is so amazing. Cool. Because we found yeah. microplastics all over planet Earth, even in places we thought were clean, like the Arctic. So having a, a maybe it would be a graphene sheet 
to go out and to collect yeah. all those plastics yes. it's really cool yes definitely i think we need to make that happen all right this fantastic and also i'm going to ask now rosie and james who are behind the scenes uh people if we've got any other pictures on our padlet to show just before we finish we're having you no know, oh these are brilliant oh, i love these so much they're so oh. lovely Fantastic. Well done, guys. Oh, I hope oh, you can make a of these for afterwards. Absolutely. Oh, that's a love molecule. I, that is, that is a, that's like a heart molecule. Mo I love the most that. important molecule of all. <laughs> a nano house. A nano house? Oh, ah, my God. It's that like is a nano house, but for atoms. No, that's I my dream. That so As an illustrator of books, that is that I love that. That's my that's fantastic. That's my and I saw a bee as well. You remember the hexagons oh, and bees? Right. Yeah, it's brilliant. These are amazing. Oh. Guys, this is a nice. the best thing ever. I've got to print them and put them all over my lab. Oh, they're so good. So good. So everyone, keep on sending those in because yeah, you might your picture might be up on um, uh, on Melissa's or Jess's wall at home one of these days. They were all fantastic, and That's we've just cool. got some comments from people just before we finish today. That Elliot and Kate, my favourite bit was making the hexagon model. Fantastic, love that too. And also we got meeting you was the best thing Aww. as well from someone. So thank you so much for whoever made that comment as well. And um, I very much um enjoyed today but um any final thoughts just before we finish from melissa and jess anything you wanted to add i uh, just thank you to everyone for making such amazing models and drawings and yeah i want to say thank you to mel for being so incredible and making science so beautiful and easy oh. to understand and thanks to everyone in the audience and to, to rosie and james and to everyone behind the scenes who managed to make this happen but also just to people who are curious about science. You know, we need more scientists and we need more problem solvers and we need more people who ask really big questions about the world and how we can make it better. And I'm, I'm hoping from all of those pictures that you can see it. Show our book off, I suppose. And yes, that explores these things in more detail. Yes. So yeah, this is, yeah, Nano. Um, yeah, me and Jess created. Team. The team best works. science art team there is. So yeah, it's been the best. And and yeah, just keep being curious because we really need you. Indeed, indeed. I think that is great. So thank you so much for the pair of you. And thank you, everyone, for um, your many inspiring questions and comments. Your pictures have been amazing. They really have. I think you can tell from all three of us, we've been amazed by your pictures from all the oohs and wows that we've been saying. So thank you so much. And please keep creating and sharing them with us. As I say, you might be on their walls one day in their offices or their labs. Um, we're also posting a link in the chat to a quick survey where you can tell us what you thought of the event and we'd love um, we'd love it if you could take just five minutes out of your day to tell us. Um, please keep an eye out for future family workshops from the Great Exhibition Road Festival. And uh, the next event is about the mysterious magical world inside the human body. So look out for that. That sounds very exciting. But once again, just to round things off, thank you to Melissa and thank you to Jess and thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, so from all of us here from the Great Exhibition Road Festival, thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.